Uh, welcome to CS4510. Uh, I think this is 9 1. And today is going to be on uh, context sensitive languages. And there's actually a second topic, which is uh, reduction via computation histories. Not sure how I'm going to fit that all into the title, but we'll see. So first, let me give you uh, or context uh, sensitive languages. So a CSL is generated by a CSG, a context sensitive grammar. A CSG, context sensitive grammar, only has uh, rules of of the form uh, alpha a beta goes to alpha gamma beta such that uh, a is just any uh, non-terminal and uh, alpha beta uh, are any string of terminals or non-terminals and gamma is a non-empty uh, non-terminal so all right this way right so basically a context-free grammar is context free if you take that literally what that means is it's like free of context like a sentence structure generated doesn't have any understanding of what's going on but a context sensitive grammar says well i can actually look a little bit before and a little bit after before making my choices so it turns out that the context sensitive grammars uh or a strict superset of the context-free grammars, right? So here's uh, CFGs. Uh, here's decidable. And then we have our new type of grammar, which is a uh, CSG, so context-sensitive uh, grammar. So in fact, most languages that you could come up with are context-sensitive. I'm not going to do any examples, but you could do things like um, you know, a one to the P, uh, such that, uh, P is prime. You could do things like uh, A to the N, B to the N, uh, C to the N. Most examples you could come up with naturally are going to be context sensitive. It's actually very difficult to find an example of, uh, a decidable language, which is not context sensitive. So the one example everyone seems to know is the equivalence of regular expressions. So uh, let the language, let's call this L. This is going to be an encoding of two regular expressions such that the language generated by R1 is equal to the language of generated by R2. Turns out this is, this, this is provably not context sensitive. And so then L is in uh, it's decidable by a Turing machine, but not by a uh, context-sensitive grammar. So, in a not-so-clean break, let me talk about a different kind of comp uh, computation. I'm going to talk about an LBA, which is a linear-bound automata. Uh, basically, it's a Turing machine uh, that can't use more space than the size of the input.
So why is it called a linear bound automata instead of like uh, just you can with some trickery with the alphabet, you can actually get up to constant size increases of this tape, right? So that's why we say it's linear. It's kind of like, uh, you know, if you don't know, might not know what this means yet, but uh, you just use linear space. So why am I introducing these models of more models of computation? Well, for two reasons. One, it's worth mentioning. And actually, these are equivalent except for the empty string, right? So the language is decidable. The LBAs, by the way, LBAs are explicitly non-deterministic. A deterministic LBA, we don't know if it is equivalent to a non-deterministic LBA. So that's an open question. Uh, LBAs, which are non-deterministic, I'll write NTM here. Uh, these are equivalent to the context-sensitive grammars. Uh, I won't go through the proof. It's a little boring, but you can imagine it's sort of similar to the proof of a uh, that we did for uh, the unrestricted grammars proof is kind of uh, like with well, the way we simulated a I guess would it have to be a non deterministic Turing machine on a uh, unrestricted grammar the second reason I want to talk about this class of languages is because I need more undecidable problems to prove and there are quite a few involving uh, this model of computation one more quick detail here is actually that uh, LBAs can accept the empty string, uh, but as defined, context-sensitive grammars cannot generate the empty string. They, the right-hand sides have to contain something. So they cannot generate the empty string. The language generated could be the empty set, but they'll never generate the empty string. So excluding empty string. Most uh, algorithms that we've come up with, with so far, most deciders for languages actually are, they use linear space, they're linear bound automata. So things like, uh, right, recall the proof, recall the proofs for, of the Turing machine for things like zero to the n, one to the n, or, uh, ww reversed or ww. So these two are context free and this one is not. Right, we just sort of put them on the tape and then we loop back and forth scanning each one and we cross one out and we go to them and cross one out and we keep track of it. We don't really use more space than what's necessary. And you think, okay, well, what about a, a language which isn't, which can't be decided on an LBA? And again, the example is uh, this one here where we need uh, the equivalence between regular expressions and it turns out it's provably exponential space. I won't get into the details, but they do exist. Um, so let's talk about some the decidability of this computational model. So of course, you may your first jump should be to the acceptance problem for LBAs. So this, if you forgot, is the encoding of an LBA. I'll call it M instead of L. A word W such that uh, M is an LBA and accepts W. So you might think that these are kind of like Turing machines, so this should be undecidable like Turing machines, but actually this is decidable. Because there's finite space, there's only finitely many configurations. So the idea is if you come to the same configuration twice, then you're going to be in an infinite loop, uh, and, and excluding some of the baggage that comes with this being non-deterministic. So you simulate the machine past the number of possible configurations, and by pigeonhole, if it's still running and it hasn't halted yet, then some configuration has been ent entered into twice, which implies the machine will loop forever. So that's the main idea. So uh, number of uh, configurations of any uh, LBA is going to be, it's going to be strictly less than, well, we need one symbol in the configuration to be the state. So we have a choice of state. The tape head can be in any of N positions, if N is the length of the tape. And uh, each symbol could contain a, uh, something uh, from the tape alphabet, right? 
and there's n symbols, so then we have uh, gamma to the n possible symbols, right? But let's just call this k. This is actually kind of ugly looking. So there's there's there is a finite amount of configurations. So here's the proof. We're going to simulate uh, the the automata on W for uh, k steps. If it halted before, then it accepted. If if accept or reject, so it's halted at this point. Uh, return that. If it hasn't halted yet, then we know it will loop forever, so we're just going to reject. So that's our decider for LABA. Now, the next language, ELBA, recall this is the encoding of an uh, of a, the machine such that the language such that the language uh, decided by the machine is the empty set so it, it accepts nothing uh, this is actually undecidable and to prove this is undecidable I need to develop a new technique called uh, computation histories detour it's a big detour actually into computation histories so a computation history is quite literally just a finite sequence of uh, configurations so uh, a computation history uh, ch is a string a finite string like uh, We'll do delimit by pound. So we say C0 pound C1 pound dot 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 pound uh, CL uh, such that let's put a pound here. Uh, C0 is the initial configuration. So this is going to be like Q0 and then like W1 dot 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 to WN. Uh, CI is yielded correctly from CI minus 1. So whatever machine we're talking about here, be it a Turing machine and LBA, CI minus 1, from CI minus 1, it immediately follows CI, right? For a non-deterministic machine, it could be multiple, but it has one has to follow, right? We say a string is an, is an accepting computation history if all this is true and uh, CL is accepting. So the reduction idea here is uh, if we have a machine, if we have an LBA, uh, to generate all accepting computation histories of M on W, then this language is only empty if uh, M does not accept W, right? Accepting computation histories of M on So that's how we're going to reduce uh, ELBA to ATM. Uh, we're going to reduce to uh, ATM. On input uh, M and W, we're going to construct uh, the LBA, we'll call it B, 
uh, from M and W, and I'll get into uh, more about this uh, in a second. Uh, if uh, B is in ELBA, uh, then we know that the language of B, by the way, is equal to the empty set. If, uh, so if, if it is in there, then we know that M does not accept W, so we must reject. Else, we're going to accept. Now let me get into this details about uh, how we make B. So recall, we're trying to make an LBA for accepting configure, for accepting computation histories of uh, M on W. So instead of actually constructing it, what I'm just going to prove is that uh, if such a decider exists for this language, it has to use uh, linear space, and therefore it's an LBA. So the recall that uh, an accepting computation history has the three conditions. One, a C0 is uh, initialization. Uh, two, uh, CI yielded, well, I'll write it this way, CI, CI minus one uh, yields uh, CI, and three, uh, CL is uh, accepting. So, input uh, to B is uh, the, con the computation history, so it's going to be, well, of course it could be any string, but uh, it's going to have the length of the, the whole, whole computation history, so it's going to be like uh, C0 to CL. Condition 1 can be checked by an LBA. Uh, you scan for Q0. Uh, at the start. Condition two is the trickiest, actually. Uh, what you do is you sort of zigzag between each uh, adjacent pair. Uh, using the transition function of L of M. to verify that uh, CI plus CI minus one yields uh, CI. And this can also be done in linear space. You don't need any extra tape. What you do is just sort of mark uh, onto the same spots, right? You would extend the uh, tape alphabet to include symbols that allow for marking, and then that's fine. And then uh, the third condition, this is the easiest. You just scan the CL portion of the input uh, if it contains uh, Q except. Okay. Therefore, B is an LBA, not a Turing machine. Now, we're, if we're assuming that B is uh, an LBA and assume that the emptiness problem for LBAs is decidable, then we construct this as follows, and using this, we can actually decide ATM, which we know is not possible. So therefore, ELBA must be undecidable. What's neat here is not the problem. Like, nobody cares about the LBA itself, but it's about the technique developed here to uh, with computation histories. We can actually uh, do a similar idea using computation histories to decide a language that I've been dying, dying to de decide, but we needed to build all this up, called all uh, CFG. And you can guess exactly what this is. This is, uh, the input is a grammar, a context-free grammar such that G is a context-free grammar, and the language generated by G uh, is equal to sigma star. Now this is actually undecidable.
that might come out as a surprise, almost a sort of like fury, because the emptiness problem for CFGs is decidable. But these are not complements of each other, right? ECFG is, uh, is, is the same here, but here is the empty set. And we did that by sort of a reverse search. We mark the terminals and we try and go back to the start state and we see if that's ever possible. This is a totally different problem. And then we have to come in it from a, to a totally different strategy, which is why we have to use these computation histories. There's a little bit of a catch though. Here we, we had the power of an LBA and we were able to say, ah, well, this is, you know, kind of obviously linear space. We can sort of wave our hands, but now we have to prove that a computation history uh, for M comma W is going to be context free. So there's actually two tricks uh, with this one. If you consider uh, computation histories a trick themselves, then these are, there's actually like three tricks. What we want is we want uh, a grammar a G uh, such that a G accepts all strings, 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 which are not uh, accepting computations of M on W, right? So what we're going to want is we're going to want the complement of uh, the set of accepting computation histories. So take, actually, there's a, here's, so the first trick is we're going to take the complement of our uh, language and we're going to prove that's context free instead of the language itself. So we're not going to prove that the complement, we're not going to prove that the set of uh, accepting figure, uh, accepting accepting computation histories is context free. We're going to prove that its complement is context free. The second trick is that if you have a uh, let's take two configurations like this. Well, C i is almost equal to C i plus one. Right? They're going to differ in like two or three bots but that's it so they're almost the same so this kind of substring of a view of a accepting computation history is kind of like uh w uh w which we know is actually not context free we proved this with the pumping lemma it's kind of complicated so what we need to do is kind of make it so we can decide it on a, on a, on a grammar. So what we're going to do is instead of this, we're going to do not reversed accepting computation histories. So a reversed accepting computation history is of the forms a C one, excuse me, C zero, cause there's an initial initial one, uh, C one R C two dot, 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 and then a uh, CL. And C L uh, is reversed, dependent upon the parity of L, obviously. But we're going to take every other computation history, and we're going to like reverse it. So this is kind of like W W R, which we know is context free. You can give a grammar for that in like three seconds. So we want the set of except the with the complement of the set of reverse accepting computation histories. We're going to prove that this language, this language is context free and is therefore decidable by this grammar. Let's call this L. Okay, so now we want to show that the complement of the reverse ACHs, uh, reversed accepting computation history, which I'm then calling L, the complement is L, uh, is context free. So an exact character or uh, a characterization of this language is as, as follows. This language contains many strings, but it also contains the strings that have these three properties. It's a uh, computation history such that C zero is not initial. Uh, CL is not 
uh, accepting and uh, C I uh, minus one uh, does not yield a C I plus one reversed. And I'm being loose with the term yield here, but uh, because it's not yielding it, it's yielding its reverse, but it's it should be unambiguous. So what I'm actually going to, I'm going to describe how you would construct the grammar uh, for these. So for one, well, we want it all strings which do not begin with uh, an initial configuration. So what I'm going to write that as is I'm going to say, well, we have all strings, well first we start with the pound sign, and we have all possible strings except the ones that start with uh, q0, w1, dot 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 to wn. Pound sign, and then the rest I sort of don't care about. Maybe it's not deterministically generated correctly, who cares. But the ones with the accepting initial, with excuse me, with the initial configuration would be in the complement of this, right? So this explicitly does not have uh, computation histories uh, with the correct initialization. This is a regular expression with a, a being a little fast and loose. This is uh, the set of all strings, which we know is regular. I made you prove on the exam that you can take out a finite amount of strings from a regular language and it'll still be regular. Uh, this is exactly one string. So this is a regular language. This is a regular language. So this whole thing is regular. Then we have a composition. So we have pound, regular language, pound, regular language. So this is regular. That's for point one. Uh, point two, uh, CL is not accepting. So we're going to do the same idea. We non-deterministically generate whatever beforehand. Uh, then we have the accepting configuration which could contain some number of tape. Recall the Turing machine can halt anywhere on the tape. So we have some before the tape. Uh, then we have uh, the ending symbol, which cannot be the accepting symbol. So I guess I should technically write it like this. That's technically how it should be. Uh, and then we have some whatever is after the tape in the configuration. And then we have the end symbol. So again, by the same argument, this is a finite set. This is a finite set of one end element. The difference is going to be regular. That as it's set as a set is also regular because it's still finite. Then we have a composition again. So then this thing is regular. Then three. This one is the trickiest. These are sort of syntactic properties, and this is a sort of semantic one. So we want to uh, think about what the sort of maximally close, almost correct string would have and then break it at like the last step. That's sort of the simplest way to think about this. So if you think about, uh, if you think about how pound C I, uh, pound uh, C I plus one R pound kind of looks, by the way, the R doesn't matter here. It just matters that one is the reverse of the other. I could have put the R here and this proof is gonna work out exactly the same. This, this kind of looks like pound, then some stuff happens then let's just say A, Q, I, B. Then some more stuff happens. Let me get a little bit shorter. Then a pound happens. And then because this is a reverse of this, I'm going to draw it the other way. So what I'm, what I'm saying here is that these two configurations are almost the same except for one little spot. So I'm going to say C, Q, J, D. Uh, this, who knows what else is on the tape. Uh, pound. Now, if we call this x, I'm saying x here is equal to x here. Excuse me. Yeah, x here. And y here is equal to y here. So this is, you can see how this is almost like a palindrome. So what you're going to do to prove this is context free, what you're going to do is produce it like a palindrome. You're going to get to the a, q, i, b, c, uh, q, j, d step. And then you're going to say choose A comma B comma C comma D, uh, such that it does not follow from 
uh, delta in M. So we want it to not follow. If it follows, then we have the accepting configuration. We want the we want a non-accepting configuration. We want it to be incorrect. If CI plus one in reverse follows from CI, then it's uh, correct. We don't want it to be correct. We want all the non-correct ones. So this is context-free. So I prove these three are context-free. What you do is you just take the union of it, right? And we proved that the union of context-free grammars, regular languages are context-free languages. So the union of these is uh, context-free. Another way to do C, uh, excuse me, another way to do three, and this is what Sipser does. Another way is he does a PDA. Uh, Non-deterministically, big word, push uh, CI onto the stack. So you're going to choose some CI. It only needs to, all the other configurations could fo follow from each other. But as long as there's one configuration which doesn't follow, uh, then it's going to be in this language. So you just non-deterministically choose one. Uh, pop off stack uh, when you see uh, the pound sign. So that means you're starting CI plus one reverse. And uh, compare Uh, C, I plus one reverse for a mismatch around the head. So this is where the state would be in the configuration. So as long as it doesn't follow from the transition function of M, and this is what the PDA would be checking, then it's... Uh, then it's context free. We take the union of all these, and this implies that uh, L here is uh, context free. So uh, let G, let L of G equal L. So, which recall, this is going to be the complement of reversed accepting computation histories. So now we can proceed with the proof. Uh, again, we're going to reduce to, recall, we're trying to prove that all CFG is undecidable, and we're going to reduce uh, to ATM. So on input, uh, M comma W, uh, what are we going to do? Uh, construct some grammar G from uh, M and W. So recall that this implies that the language generated by the grammar is going to be sigma star. So language, uh, the language generated by this grammar is the is all strings which are not verse accepting computation histories. So that means if there was an accepting computation history, it would not be in L of G. So if uh, M accepts W then uh, there exists uh, a string not in uh, L of G. So that's sort of the idea that we're going to use here. So the two cases are sigma star or sigma star minus the specific string, which would be the reverse accepting computation history uh, of M on W. If G accepts all strings, that means that there is no computation history, a valid computation history of M on W. So then we reject. Else we accept. Okay. That's prob probably one of the tougher proofs in this class, but that's sort of the uh, strategy. Now that we have uh, all CFG is undecidable. We can use that to prove a lot more undecidable uh, properties of context-free languages that are more in the style of a classical reduction. Okay, the proof is actually relatively straightforward. We're going to reduce uh, to all CFG to prove that uh, E uh, Q CFG is undecidable. And recall in our notation, this is the encoding of two grammars, G one g2 such that 
the language of G1 is equal to the language of G2, uh, this is undecidable. So, well, the proof is actually quite straightforward. Uh, on input, we're going to decide all CFG. So on input G, um, let G0 be the grammar which generates all strings. So it's like S goes to uh, 0, S, or 1, S, or epsilon. So this clearly the grammar uh, for G0 here is going to be sigma star, right? So, so the language of G0 is clearly sigma star. Uh, then if uh, G1, excuse me, G, G0 was in EQ uh, CFG, so we're assuming that this is decidable if we could determine if it is in there or not. Then that means these accept the same language, which which implies that G accepts all strings. So we accept. And then else, of course, we're going to reject. So using this, we can construct a very simple decider for all CFG. But we know through a very long and lengthy proof, actually, that all CFG is undecidable. So therefore, EQ CFG must also be undecidable. So let's give a little table now of what we've done so far. We've done uh, the acceptance problems. We've done um, the emptiness problems. We've done the equality problems. And we've done the all problems. So let's construct a little table. We have DFA up here. We have uh, the next highest is going to be context-free languages, so I'll say context-free grammars. Then we have the new ones today. We have linear bound automaton, so context-sensitive. And then finally, we have the decidable languages, so we'll say Turing machines. So uh, for what of these do we know? Those are the, the least straight lines I've ever seen. So all DFA, uh, excuse me, DFA accepting a string, that's decidable. Uh, is the DFA is the DFA accepting no strings? That's decidable. Uh, we do the reachability argument to a final state. Does uh, can we determine equality between DFAs? Actually, yes, we can. We convert them to the same DFA and then check them if they're like isomorphic, in a colored graph sense. Can we determine if the DFA accepts all strings? Yes, we can. We can run that algorithm that I never talked about for my home road and we get to a single state and then we just check if it's the one that uh, accepts all strings. What about a C of G? So right off the bat, we prove that this is undecidable. This is undecidable. But uh, the emptiness problem is decidable and the acceptance problem by Chomsky normal form is decidable. What about for linear bound automata? Well, we proved that emptiness for linear bound automata was not decidable, but acceptance was decidable because there's so finitely many configurations. And again, equality is not going to be decidable, and uh, all is also not going to be decidable. I didn't talk about these two, but perhaps you can believe me. I'll explain why in a second. Turing machine acceptance not decidable, right? From halting, uh, emptiness ETM not decidable. Equality between Turing machines not decidable. Uh, does this Turing machine accept all strings? I haven't talked about this one, but this is also not decidable. So. The stronger our model of comp computation, right, the more power we get, the less we can actually know about these machines. We sort of, we get closer and closer uh, to this horizon uh, with the Church Turing thesis. We lose the ability to tell things. A Turing machine cannot understand things about itself, really. It can understand things very strongly about the computers weaker than it. And there's a sort of gradient here you can kind of visualize. Now, if you were some sort of formalist like Hilbert, you might try and argue, well, this whole thing is dependent upon the church Turing thesis. Hilbert has been dead for like 100 years. So that's how I imagine he would sound. Uh, and, you know, you were introducing all these undecidable problems uh, only dependent upon the existence 
of Turing machines and you've just invented all this stuff. You've just you've just made more work for everyone. Well, I needed to build up all this work because next time I'm going to prove to you an undecidable language which has absolutely nothing to do with Turing machines. There's nothing to do with computation. It's not a self understanding problem. It's a totally it's a problem totally independent of Turing machines. And we're going to use uh, computation histories to prove that next time.